Good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, ladies and gentlemen, and friends, and everybody that is joining us uh, today for this uh, roundtable. Um, uh, just some housekeeping announcements uh, to make sure that our session runs smoothly. Please note that live interpretation is available in English and French. You can select the appropriate channel at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Please also note that in order to access the interpretation, you will have to download, install, and use the latest Zoom application on your PC or laptop. If you connect using a web browser, the interpretation and some other features will not be available. The link is available here in the chat box, and you are getting all the details. Uh, I also kindly know, uh, please also note that you are muted and your camera is off. Uh, and this is part of the normal procedure, but you will be able to take floor and ask questions at the end of the round table by using the raising hand feature. Please bear in mind that the time is being tight, so speakers might not be able to take or answer all your questions. We appreciate your understanding. If you have any technical issue or question uh, because you cannot uh, hear or anything, please uh, type in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen and we will try to solve your problem. <clears throat> Today we have, uh, and we're very pleased to be accompanied by uh, our Assistant Director General for the Social and Human Sciences Program of UNESCO, Mrs. Gabriela Ramos, who unfortunately is going to be joining us a little bit late, but and so we will have her afterwards. But we are very, very happy uh, also, and I will give the floor immediately uh, to Mr. Yoshiaki Ishida uh, from uh, the Japanese um, from the Japanese permanent delegation for UNESCO. The floor is yours, please. Uh, could you hear me clearly? If you can hear, if you can speak a bit louder, please. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, it's okay. Could you uh, hear me clearly? Yeah, I, I think my, my, if you can speak a bit louder, it will louder. be good. Ah, okay. So, how about this? Uh, hello? Hello, yeah. Yes. So, Okay, may I have a word now? Okay. So, uh, good morning. Chair uh, of International Bioethics Committee, Ms. Schneibais, Assistant Director General, Madam Ramos, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is such an honor to say a few words here today on behalf of the Government of Japan on the occasion of the third round table on the ethics of genome editing. Today's rapidly advancing life science is beneficial to people, but raises ethical questions which may threaten human dignity and rights, such as how will these issues concerning bioethics affect our circumstances and existence as a human beings. Given the situation by COVID-19 pandemic and its correspondence, our daily lives are next to the issues concerning the bioethics, so that it is increasing the opportunities to consider it as well. Thus, these are the challenges that we are now facing. To manage the issues, it is really important that not only researchers and scientists, but also general people recognize and share more understanding of what aspects we should bear in mind when dealing with new technologies. Therefore, I am confident this series of round tables is really timely and will provide a great opportunity for all of us. This is a third round table of the series. It aims to think about the influence that the progress of the genome editing technology gives in our society from an ethical point of view. Regarding the past two roundtables, we have made videos in accordance with each theme 
were released and received a high evaluation from all over the world. As a donor of this project, I am very proud of this roundtable series. I believe that based on the work on ethics achieved by UNESCO, this roundtable will promote further dialogue and deepen our understanding of the relationship between human society and advanced technology by an interdisciplinary approach. Lastly, I would like to express my gratitude to Mitsu Chia and Madam ADG and her team from the Secretariat and panelists who made tremendous efforts to organize this roundtable series. I look forward to a very meaningful roundtable and expect further deep discussion with growing much interest for Biosix today. Thank you for your attention. Merci, merci beaucoup. Uh, thank you, Monsieur. thank you very much, Mr. Ishida. I would like to start this presentation of our roundtable by thanking the whole team of the ethics division at UNESCO, of course, Daphna van Holt and Oreo Ekibe, who uh, played a great role in the organization of this roundtable. I'd like also to thank UNESCO and in particular our uh, ADG, Gabriela Ramos, as well, of course, as Mr. Ishida for all of the support given to us by the government of Japan for the organization of these round tables, as indeed this is the third round table organized on this theme of genome editing. And you will find on the website of UNESCO, not only the recordings of the first two round tables, but also a series of short videos that were made these occasions in order to explain what genome editing is. Hervé, Gabriela. So I'm going to give the floor to our ADG, Gabriela, Gabriela Ramos. You have the floor. Thank you for being with us. I'm really sorry to interrupt you, my dear Hervé. I simply wanted to welcome everybody. And thank you, Mr. Ishida, for your, for your words. And, um, and, and to say that uh, I, I don't know how you do it, uh, uh, Hervé, because uh, we were with the vaccines last week, we were with the committees last week, and I know you are in many other uh, frameworks advancing these important uh, issues on the ethics of science and the ethics of genome. And on top, we're having this uh, conversation today, which is always useful. Uh, thanks to the government of Japan. And of course, thanks to Davna and the team for having advanced this in a very, very tight schedule. We're really grateful and fortunate to, to be able to draw uh, of, with the very distinguished panels that we have today a very wide range of expertise and public engagement. Uh, we know that uh, Sonia is a TV producer. We know that Kevin is a researcher actively seeking community uh, consent. Tessie is a policy maker and of course uh, our, our chair as a moderator. And let me just um, recall that uh, in 2020, when the, the Nobel Prize Committee awarded the, the prize to, for chemistry to Emmanuel Charpentier, and Jennifer Dobna, um, the Swedish Academy of Science congratulated them for discovering one of the genes technology's sharpest tool. And so these uh, amazing technologies continue to deliver uh, for many issues. Uh, again, as we do with all the sciences that are being analyzed in the International Bioethics Committee that is uh, chaired by uh, um, uh, Hervé, um, we are always at all in terms of the impressive power of these technologies. Uh, we know how they are contributing to uh, address uh, uh, illnesses that uh, some decades ago would be unthinkable that we will be able to solve the issues like uh, some cancer therapies, some genetic diseases. Uh, it's also being used to develop crops that withstand mild 
pest and drought contributing to fight hunger. Um, and, and, and there on and on and on, mountains of, of applications that are really, really advancing the well-being and the health status of our population. But as the Nobel Committee also noticed, the technology also raised uh, serious ethical and societal issues. And it is of the utmost importance that the technology is carefully regulated and used in responsible manner. And I feel this is the core of uh, the social and human science sector of UNESCO. And this is the core of UNESCO. Uh, it is what the committee do every day, the, the, our committees on science and technology. But I also want to say that this round table, this is the third edition that the government of Japan has been uh, supporting. And I want to recognize Ambassador Oike, really help us to, to, to understand better, to, 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 to look at the issues and to, and to see how we can contribute to a better framing of this, of this important work. Uh, UNESCO has achieved three uh, international uh, global standards instrument in the field of, bio of bioethics. The Universal Declaration on the Human Genome and Human Rights in 1997, the International Declaration on Human Genetic Data in 20, uh, 2003, and in 2005, we delivered the Universal Declaration on Bioethics and Human Rights. It was not only the standard setting, but there was also this uh, common narrative and the advancement on institutional uh, 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 capacities that I feel are so important. And now we're doing it with the recommendation of ethics of artificial intelligence uh, that is also playing a very important role uh, in the biological sciences uh, and now and in the years to come um, and, and providing with very good uh, uh, solutions, but again, with, the, with some risks that need to be addressed. Uh, in updating uh, its reflection on the human genome and human rights in 2015, the ICB called for a moratorium of genome engineering of the human germline, at least as long as the safety and efficacy of the procedures are adequately proven uh, as treatments. And at this time, 40 countries either discourage or ban research on germline editing because of ethical and, sa and safety concerns. And since then, the calls have multiplied Emmanuel Charpentier him, herself uh, was among the scientists who signed a letter in Nature in 2019 calling for a moratorium on clinical uses of human germline editing to allow time for discussions about the technical, scientific, medical, societal, ethical, and moral issues that surround uh, these, these uh, questions. Um, and, and also to provide time to establish an international framework. And so it's, it's important to remember that most of the discussion is around the germline te techniques. And again, there are upsides and downsides. And in 2016, uh, 15, when scientists in the UK successfully used uh, somatic gene therapy on a little girl called Lila, you remember this was all over the newspapers, to help fight leukemia, the reaction was uh, cautiously favorable. But these therapies also change the DNA in reproductive cells, and these changes are passed on to the future generations. And that worries many, many people, experts and non-experts alike. And, and then you call to, to come with the mis misinformation, uh, the false arguments against uh, messenger RNA COVID vaccines is that they alter the D DNA of recipients. So there is always all these discussions and we need to know. And therefore, these uh, kind of debates, these kind of changes are so important. It's so important to have the voices from societies uh, we at, uh, at in the Secretariat believe that engaging with civil society is key, and therefore the debate today is really important uh, to advance. So count on us uh, to follow up. Uh, now that I have delivered my inaugural speech, I will be going into the most uh, interesting part for me, which is to listen to the experts. So thank you so much, and let's just uh, go to the round table. Merci mille fois, Gabriela, pour, uh, Thank you so much, Gabriela, for this introduction and for reminding us the works of the committee, uh, works that are available online on the UNESCO website in various languages. And thank you for reminding us of the two uh, declarations. 
And I'd like to dwell on it a little bit. I think that UNESCO, among its mandates and its missions within the UN for science and technology, when it considers that any scientific project, any new possibility of medical intervention, and today we are dealing with the, uh, genome editing, all of this has to be uh, actually uh, conceived, taking into account society uh, challenges and respect of human rights. So this is obvious. And given the current context, we see that with COVID, the, the significance of science in discussions. And for years, and you reminded us, uh, Gabriela, that in 2015, we had already published a report uh, relating to genome editing. And many of the discussions and debates that I attended always mentioned this sentence that I'm going to tell you in English, and we find it in all published opinion. No decision on whether to pursue editable genome modification can be legitimate without broadly including and substantially meaningful public engagement. And this sentence, this statement is found in the two global summits that gather the various academic sectors, but also in all opinions published in literature. Yes, but what do we see? Well, we see there are still always expert debates, but at one point we need actually to have concrete action. That is that we need to invite the public around the table at last. So we've seen with COVID-19 how dialogue and cross-cutting issues in society was important in order to understand uh, scientific information. And in March 2020, we published a declaration calling for more cooperation and dialogue to fight uh, COVID pandemic. It was simply in terms of preventive measures at the time, but also last Wednesday, a call that was uh, launched here at UNESCO, and you can hear the recordings of two round tables in which the Director General of UNESCO and the Secretary General of the UN uh, took part. So dialogue, dialogue also is supported by uh, other partners such as Irish NGO that is represented here today and that has supported UNESCO. So what uh, about actually public engagement? Three steps at least. First, technical and scientific advances. So we need an education stage. Without a basic scientific education, if we do not know what are the scientific terms and the scientific challenges and opportunities, and also the uncertainties at a given time, then it's not possible to have a debate. Because here we're not dealing with something real. So in the universe of fake news, misinformation, how can we actually share scientific knowledge and also uncertainties, scientific uncertainties in the various fields that we cover for genome editing? In that field, we have uncertainties, for example, for off-target effects. Second stage, actually, a public engagement. How can we create a dialogue? This information from the those who know towards those who have to receive this education with the public engagement, it actually works both ways from scientists to the public, but also much more so from the public towards the scientists. And the third part, it's the goal in any democracy, it's empowerment. 
public empowerment. And that is the possibility of having a democratic debate in order to decide how we want or we don't want to use technology in which situations we consider it is legitimate, in which cases we think there should be a defined framework to regulate and limit it. For these three aspects, we'll need to act with transparency, accountability. These are our guiding principles. We need to work with objectivity, honesty, to give the public all the clarifications it has the right to receive. So we need to think about how to organize this debate and what would be the role of an international organization such as UNESCO? Actually, it's to take part in the debate and to support any type of engagement we can have in order to support, organize, give a voice, and give a voice to all populations around the world. Uh, it should not be restricted to a few happy few, to uh, some specific cultures, this right to dialogue. And I think that Sonia Pemberton with the Global Citizen Assembly is going to tell us about this inclusive dimension that is critical, an active reflection process. And a reflection process that must be really open, transparent, listening to all possibilities. And today we are lucky because we have three actors in that amazing field. Sonia Pemberton, who is going to speak first. And I was very lucky because I met her in Hong Kong in 2018. And together we listen with amazement on the advances, quote unquote, of John Kuhei, that is the birth of the Chinese twins who had been genetically modified. She's a great documentary filmmaker. She's going to tell us about an action she launched for an international deliberation process. Then we will be very lucky because we'll hear one of the researchers very committed in the gene drive field, Kevin Esveld. And he was also one of the scientific pioneers in the field and also one of the the very first ones who considered immediately that it was not possible to have scientific and technological development without a discussion with population for whom these techniques of gene drive would be used. That is, uh, people in Massachusetts for the Lyme disease or uh, people in Africa for the uh, changes in mosquitoes to uh, uh, fight malaria. And then we'll hear Tessia Khan as the chair of DH Bio in the Council of Chiron. She actually moderated a discussion about a public debate. How can you support this public debate? And asking the question, who has legitimacy to propose a public debate? Who has legitimacy to actually moderate in a, at a given time this debate? who has legitimacy to hear the voice of the public and to give it a new echo. So I'm going to stop at this for now. And I am delighted now to give the floor right away to Sonia Pemberton. Sonia? Hello. Hello, Sonia. Um, hello and uh, good evening from Australia. Good evening and uh, good morning for Kevin. Uh, we eat east, meet west, uh, north, meet south. So yeah, the floor is yours. Lovely. Thank you so much for inviting me, Hervé. Would you like me to begin? Yes, please. Okay. So I am very honored to be here today. Um, I am a writer, a director, and a producer of films. Uh, probably not the usual sort of person you might have at this kind of seminar. 
Um, just some background. I lead a company called Gene Pool Productions. We are an Australian based documentary group uh, and we specialize in creating high quality science films for international audiences. I do a lot of work with Arte, uh, ZDF, uh, PBS, our ABC and SBS and others. So in essence, I am a professional science communicator and my job is to engage the public. We've tackled many complex and often very polarized stories uh, in our films. We've explored vaccines, cancer, uranium, <laughs> climate change. Our ambition with all of our films is to reduce public confusion and fear around science, and ultimately to make useful films, films that help the public in some way. Now, our documentaries reach many millions of viewers worldwide, sometimes tens of millions, and they've been recognized with over 80 international awards. In 2012, I'm very proud to say we won an Emmy for our film on genetics uh, with Professor Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for her work. So I've been deeply interested in genetics and specifically genome editing for quite a few years now. In 2018, as Hervé said, um, we attended the uh, second international summit on human genome editing in Hong Kong, where the so-called CRISPR babies were announced. And I was there like many others. Uh, I witnessed the fierce reactions, the global alarm and the deep stirrings of public fear. As those of you who might have been there would recall, the media were everywhere. There were hundreds of journalists. And personally, I've never seen so many cameras in one place before. But on the final day of the summit, I noticed something that worried me. That was the day that was dedicated to the issue of public engagement. But, and here's the problem that sparked all of my thinking from that point. Most of the media had gone home. There were only a handful of us there that, at that stage to listen to the whole wonderful gamut of people talking about public engagement. So there's clearly a great deal of talk about needing broad public engagement with genome editing technologies. And of course, there are a growing number of films and TV programs explaining the science and raising the issues. There are many terrific community events happening across many different regions. And of course, there are many, many, many meetings of scientists and experts, although those are often held behind closed doors. So the question for me at the summit was, how can we do better? How might we globally engage a diverse range of people and really importantly, how can we give the people a voice in one of the biggest issues of our times, and ideally at scale? And so at that summit on that day, the germ of an idea was born. That idea led me to working with over 25 leading scientists across the world. I think we have nine countries committed now. And last year we were published in one of the world's top journals, Science which is pretty amazing for a filmmaker. <laughs> I didn't ever expect to be a, a, a co-author on a paper. So to explain what we've been doing, I'd like to show you a very short three minute video. So uh, if we could play the video, please. We have reached a singular global moment. We now have the technology to redesign life and sculpt evolution. We can edit genes with unprecedented ease and precision. Any genes, in plants, animals and people. How are we to apply this technology? What sort of future do we want? And who gets to decide? These are fundamental questions that belong not just to science, but to all humanity. 
Soon, gene editing will impact all our lives. We must bring in the people to help scientists, governments and regulators understand and act upon the hopes and fears surrounding this technology at a global level. Now, for the first time, citizens of the world are coming together to help shape our genomic future. It begins with researchers across the world sampling public opinion on genome editing. 100 citizens will then be randomly selected, representing a diversity of perspectives, nationalities, ages and experience. They're not scientists, they're people off the street, coming together to form the world's first Global Citizens' Assembly. Over five days, they explore real-world ethical dilemmas. Each provokes a question. What's okay? What's not? They call expert witnesses. They learn. They deliberate. They reflect on their views. Can they accept genome editing of plants, animals, humans? If so, under what conditions? Will they find useful common ground? Is there a line that cannot be crossed? For the first time, global citizens will have their say, shaping the values, decisions and policies that will determine the fates of future generations. The project is a collaboration between Gene Pool Productions, who will amplify the conversation via a three-part documentary series, and the Centre for Deliberative Democracy and Global Governance, together with an international network of research partners, who will convene the world's first Global Citizens' Assembly, an unprecedented global experiment. So that is uh, a short video just to give you an idea, uh, a summary really of the project. Um, and as I said, it was born out of sitting there um, at the summit, wondering what on earth could we do? I want to be clear, uh, this project is an experiment. Uh, it hasn't been done before. There are obviously many citizens assemblies and citizens juries and deliberation events at all sorts of local and national levels, often on complex issues involving scientific and technological risk. But this is the world's first global citizens assembly. Now it's a challenge to explore such a complex issue at a global level, let alone in multiple languages. But fortunately, we have a global team of experts, including our Professor John Dryzek, who actually wrote a book and invented this kind of idea of how we might do a global citizens' assembly. Uh, and this team are all committed to designing, running and facilitating this event at a world class level. Now, I am a filmmaker, I'm not a researcher, so I'm responsible for amplifying the conversation via the global television series. Now, one thing that I think is really key to this whole project is we will apply the principles of science to the whole process. We will measure the impact of the global citizens jury event, our citizens assembly event, and the subsequent documentary series will measure the impact on individuals, the ones involved in the, jury, in the assembly and the wider public who watch the program. So we will be monitoring how people feel about the technology before, during and after the event. Did the participants change their views after considering the issues? How did they change? Did the audience at home also change their views after watching the process unfold on screen? If so, why? So we want to measure how well we actually engage the public. Now, why are we doing all this? Because, of course, we believe the issue of genome editing is too important 
to be left to scientists, regulators, and politicians alone. Now, as a filmmaker, I've had to learn an awful lot about citizen participation and deliberation over the last two years. I knew very little about it originally. And it turns out there's a core difference between traditional citizen engagement, that is when we just tell people what's going on, and citizen deliberation when we're hearing from them. And it's that interplay, that conversation between science and society that is key. And it's fundamentally what I'm really interested in here. There are many, many studies that show that lay people can engage meaningfully with technology and with the associated complex ethical, legal and societal issues. Their opinions, insights and their values are important and they can also be useful. They can help develop a moral and political framework for decision-making. And of course, they provide a much better understanding of community concerns and expectations. Now, I've discovered that the actual process of deliberation is very organized, deeply studied, and intrinsically purposeful. It's carefully designed and facilitated to allow diverse views to emerge, to avoid grandstanding and advocacy, and instead encourage informed consideration of really complex issues. Now, we all trust juries in court cases to reach good judgments. Similarly, deliberation is a powerful way to harness the wisdom of crowds as it enables the participants to piece together the different bits of information, to think about it, to ask questions, to express concerns, to form opinions, test those opinions, and ultimately make recommendations or even decisions. So what do we want this Global Citizens' Assembly to do? Well, firstly, we seek the considered opinions of a representative sample of the population no small task on a global level. We want to hear from them, learn what they feel, what they think, when they consider this technology. What's okay for them? What's not? Under what conditions? Why do they feel that way? We want to explore a wide range of hopes and fears. We want to consider people's values. What do they really care about? What do they prioritize? And of course, we'll ensure we have views from diverse or marginalized perspectives. Now, the priorities may be quite different across different ages, cultures, and of course, life experience. Secondly, we want the participants to establish some broad principles or guidelines for the regulation of the technology. The question is, can they reach a shared outcome or not? either will be fascinating and important. Can they sh help shape how we choose to use this technology? And can the people informed by scientists and ethicists and others help build a better future for all? So why is the citizen assembly approach useful? Well, public confidence in technologies and their applications can be improved by having public participation in the decisions around the regulations of those technologies. It helps build knowledge, of course, but perhaps more importantly, it helps build trust. And look, we've all seen it um, all over the world. There's this disconnect. Connect a mighty gap between the experts and the people, uh, whatever the people is or the experts are. There's often this sense of us versus them. And sometimes people are, of course, worried that the experts have a stake in the technology or have competing interests, which, of course, at times may be true. So this process brings those two worlds together under the framework that we are all in this together. So let's explore this technology, let's listen to each other, and let's just see where we end up. So if the Citizens' Assembly event allows people to engage, reflect, and deliberate, 
at a really deep level, perhaps a deeper level than other forms of public engagement. The next step is where I come in. My contribution, the filming of the deliberations and the crafting of a documentary series around them creates an opportunity for a much broader societal reach, for more reflection and hopefully more understanding. So what will we do? We'll create a three-part documentary series around the event. We'll pick some of the key participants to follow really closely as they go through the Citizens' Assembly. We'll track how they think, how they feel, and how they change over time. Now at home, the audience will see the same evidence that the participants do. We're going to create a series of short blue chip science films, and they're designed to uh, explain the technology, offer real world examples, and highlight the promise and the dangers of this technology. Each of the stories that we're going to be filming will build in complexity and, and extend our understanding of the science and its challenges, uh, and will literally progress them to get more and more complicated. And step by step, we'll move into genome editing, guided not only by researchers, but also by artists, by ethicists, by entrepreneurs. We'll also look to the past and to the future, asking how could we use this power? And who decides? So ultimately, the audience at home will share the journey of the participants and witness the challenge of trying to set up a set of global principles around the use of these technologies. The audiences at home will see themselves reflected in some of the people and some of the conversations, and maybe the opposite will happen. At times, they won't agree. They'll, they'll, they'll be pushed up against their own bias, their own ideas. But they'll see reflections of a range of worldviews. Now, we already have in place worldwide distribution. We will communicate to as many global audiences as possible across as many platforms as possible, and in as many languages as possible. So in this way, we'll take what happens within the Citizens' Assembly, and we will amplify that conversation from hundreds of people to millions of people. Now, as a science communicator with 25 years experience in the area of making science films, I have studied closely the ways in which people engage with complexity. I've also worked with leading um, theorists and researchers on how best to avoid tr uh, triggering fear and polarization, because we all know there's many films out there that just feed on fear and drama and controversy. One thing that's been really interesting, the, the data that I've been able to, to look at suggests that at the moment, the general public are largely unaware of genome editing technology and all it can do. So I believe we can get ahead of any potential fear and any potential polarization to build public confidence and understanding. Now, as a filmmaker, there's all sorts of tools uh, and techniques and guidelines I use. But in essence, we can do this by firstly engaging people's curiosity, telling them a story they haven't heard, the story of this extraordinary event, all these people coming together. And it's a story that has an arc and it speaks to the head and the heart. We can also do this by being transparent about the benefits and risks of this technology, by acknowledging the people's concerns and by acknowledging where there is uncertainty. We can embrace complexity. So I think we have an opportunity to invite the public into the very heart of this decision-making process. And of course, the stakes are very real. All our futures will be shaped by this technology. So finally, on the last day of the Global Citizens' Assembly, the participants will present their hard-won recommendations. Now, ideally, we would like to have key stakeholders in the room, 
we would love to involve UNESCO and the United Nations, the World Health Organization and other leading organizations and regulators across the globe. We want world experts to listen to the voice of the citizens at this crucial moment. So my request of all of you today is, can you help us bring key decision makers and partners to this event? Who should be there? How might we get them to participate? And can you help us build this project and make it as powerful as it needs to be? I hope you will consider joining us. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sonia. Thank you for this uh, call and this uh, enlightening uh, presentation and proposal. And I hope uh, our public, which is uh, uh, already almost 250 people, 227 uh, to be precise, uh, will uh, hear you and uh, enjoy. And now we are going to move to uh, a second expert uh, who has uh, already uh, experienced uh, some kind of, uh, uh, of public engagement, but also of a uh, TV series. Uh, Kevin Esvelt is one of the star of a wonderful mini series by Netflix named Unnatural Selection, where we see uh, how uh, he's uh, engaging the public uh, in discussions on gene rail uh, and especially uh, peoples of the Nantucket uh, Island uh, to discuss with uh, Lyme disease and some other. So, Kevin is a scientist. Uh, 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 one of the uh, pioneers of uh, gene drive, this particular technique of genome editing. And now, uh, Kevin, the floor is yours for 20 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Harari, for the very kind invitation and introduction. So I would like to tell a story a bit about genome editing and how long we've been at it and what is new and how that changes, how we need to bring communities into the discussion and when that needs to happen from the perspective of someone who is a developer of these applications and novel approaches to editing wild organisms. Now, we've been editing other species for thousands of years and indeed ourselves through artificial selection, selective breeding. But it's only fairly recently that we've learned to make precise edits in genomes. And I played a very minor role in the development of CRISPR genome editing in 2013, in which we can insert a desired change in the genome using CRISPR as a form of molecular scissors. But this only allows us to edit individual organisms, not to edit populations. But later that year, I realized if we encode the CRISPR genome editing machinery along with the desired change, when we edit an organism, then once one copy goes in, it will cut the other chromosome because we have two and copy itself over. When that organism mates, that guarantees that all the offspring inherit. And in the reproductive cells of those offspring, genome editing happens again, which ensures that the next generation inherits and the next and the next and the next. So this is what we refer to as a gene drive. That is a phenomenon where an alteration that is made to an organism can actually spread through a population, even if it doesn't help that organism reproduce. That's because it increases the chance that it will be inherited rather than increasing the number of offspring. And what that means is that we can now consider editing wild populations. It's also a bit terrifying, speaking as one who is in large part morally responsible for the consequences however they might turn out. So I'm going to emphasize one particular aspect of this technology, which is that it's fundamentally different from editing a plant that we're going to eat or doing some editing in cells to have them produce a drug that we're going to take. That's because if my laboratory develops a new drug, a new medicine, and it's approved, and your doctor recommends it to you, then you can always say no. You can choose not to be affected by the consequences of our research. But if we develop an eco-technology, something like a gene drive that is intended to be released into the environment to change that shared environment, that's going to affect everyone who lives there. 
So even if your community votes on it first and you're outvoted, you're still going to be affected. And what that means is that we need to invite you to share your voice early enough to make a difference. Otherwise, we are denying you a voice in decisions intended to affect you that you won't be able to opt out of. That's the difference between an eco-technology with shared impact on communities because it affects the environment and something that we can individually choose to make use of or not. And that's why when we first disclosed the possibility of CRISPR-based gene drive in 2014 and attempted to warn the world that we needed to use safeguards and begin discussions, we called for transparency before we actually developed these technologies in the laboratory. And in fact, we did that before we even tested it ourselves. This isn't normally done, but we felt this was incredibly important because the only way that communities can have a voice in how these technologies are developed is if they get a voice early enough in the process to shape the development of the technology itself. In other words, it's wonderful to have a global conversation about where we're interested in going as a civilization. But when it comes to actually shaping the technology itself, it needs to be done at the early design phase in the laboratory. That is, researchers need to say, we can do this, we can do X, we can do Y, or we can do Z, or we can do nothing. What would you prefer? and communities need to be able to weigh in. So I'm gonna tell a little bit about two stories on how we've begun this process with different local communities. I'm not claiming they're representative. In fact, in many cases, they were not designed to be representative. The first story has to do with the Mice Against Ticks project, which seeks to prevent Lyme disease in the environment. This project is not begun because I think Lyme disease is the most terrible affliction of humanity. It's not the most urgent that we absolutely must address. Rather, we began this project specifically so that we could figure out how best to have communities guide technology development. So the basic idea is that Lyme disease occurs when the normal cycle of the spirochete responsible gets passed back and forth between mice and ticks, but then one of the ticks that gets infected bites a human rather than a mouse or another mammal host. We've been increasing the fraction of mice, which are a very good reservoir, and ticks in the environment. And what that means is that we've been increasing the amount of Lyme disease. So I thought I was looking for a problem that was local to my community that could plausibly be addressed by genome editing in the environment where the communities might be interested. And the reason was, on the, I found that on the islands of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which are some of the hardest hit by Lyme disease, we could plausibly edit the local mouse population to prevent them from getting infected and then passing it on to ticks. But we wanted to do this specifically because these communities have a long tradition of New England town hall democracy. That is people in the community getting together to decide how the community should proceed on issues that will affect all of them. And I was very explicit in our first conversation with the people of Nantucket that this was the goal, at least as much as addressing Lyme disease. We wanted to set a model to figure out how this could work. We wanted to, to show that you can actually have a community-guided genome editing application where the community is consulted on whether to proceed before the project begins, before any money is raised. And the community makes decisions about which direction the technology development proceeds leading up to an eventual application. And so we asked the citizens what they would want. First, is this something they would be interested in at all? And if so, how should we go about it? Should we immunize the mice against just Lyme disease, against ticks, against other diseases, against everything? And later on, in subsequent meetings, we asked them, how do you want us to go about it? Is it okay if we insert a CRISPR system, for example? Because that's not normally found in mice. Do you want us to instead engineer the mice using only DNA natively found in the mice? Is that important? 
And what we found through these many, many meetings, and here I'm only listing some of them because we've gone back to these communities over and over and over again to engage them, is that first, it is possible to have communities guide the research, at least when they're very well educated, like those of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard. So it is at least possible. We have steering committees from each island that guide the research and development, and each of the island's committees has a, what you might call a dedicated skeptic, someone who does not like the idea of the project at all, but approves of the way that we're going about it, even if they will almost certainly vote against introducing any gene-edited mice. We found that communities on the whole clearly prefer cisgenic mice. That is, they don't want us to use any non-mouse DNA. And even though that means we can't use any form of CRISPR, they don't want us to use any kind of gene drive, not because they're against gene drive, but because they don't want us to use non-mouse DNA. And CRISPR is from bacteria. More on that later. The community members have raised concerns that we hadn't anticipated that might actually change how they decide to release mice, assuming that they eventually do. But most striking was from many, many, many people we heard, I'm not so sure about this idea of editing the mice, but this is how science should be done. So I will support this project. I am absolutely behind it. I think it should proceed, even if I might vote against it eventually. That was a very, very common assessment. The second project is a little bit different because it's also something that we intended to develop for use at home, as it were test it on yourself. And in fact, this one, we hope to begin field trials on the MIT campus itself. And that's something we can do because unfortunately we do have a bit of a rodent problem on campus as indeed right. does pretty much everywhere. So we call this project Rarity because the goal is to make rodents a rarity without having to use any in inhumane poisons or rodenticides. Now, current rodent control is ineffective there's clearly too many rodents in too many places. And it's poorly targeted. That is, when we poison rodents, often the things that eat the rodents then die themselves. And they die horrible deaths. It takes 72 hours to die of an anticoagulant rodenticide. And we believe we can do better by genetically reducing the fecundity of rodent populations. And this can be done with or without gene drive. You have to introduce more rodents initially to do it without gene drive, but it's still possible. Now, again, we were developing this for use in the United States at home, but when you develop a technology, you have to assume that other people will, are likely to use it somewhere else. And I learned very early on that Aotearoa New Zealand had an initiative called Predator Free 2050 in which they explicitly wanted to eradicate all invasive rats from their islands. It seemed reasonable that if we develop this technology, there would be strong pressure to apply it there. And Aotearoa, of course, has a, has a very strong indigenous community, the Maori. And I was concerned that even though New Zealand is quite progressive and consults the Maori, the Mataranga Maori, the indigenous wisdom of the Maori, the cultural knowledge and ecological knowledge acquired over time for regulation, I was still concerned that perhaps we were missing something that we could develop the technology in a way that would perhaps be more acceptable to the Maori, that might be done in a way that was consistent with their beliefs. Or we could find that it was perhaps not a good idea for use in Aotearoa, in which case we could speak out against its use there, even while pursuing it in our own country. So, I reached out to a number of Maori leaders, particularly on environmental issues from iwis that sort of span what you might call the cultural and political spectrum in Aotearoa. And we began building relationships and have been for the last four or so years. But this coincided with another concern of mine, which is not just that we might develop something that could be used in a place where it was in fact not a good idea and in ways where reductionist ecology might not be able to tell us that it's not a good idea, but also that we might be developing technologies that are perhaps too powerful for the applications that we seek to use them for. The original form of gene drive that we outlined will spread to affect the bulk of the species. 
And there are times when we might want to do that, such as altering mosquitoes to eventually eradicate malaria. That's a case where we might want to edit the entire species of malarial mosquito, because there's only a handful of species out of several thousand mosquito species that transmit malaria. Edit just those, and we could plausibly get rid of the disease without actually getting rid of any of mosquito species. But for conservation applications, such as in Aotearoa, we really shouldn't build a gene drive system to suppress the rodents that will plausibly spread to rodents elsewhere in the world, where they may be playing an important ecological role. But certainly people would be very upset at the notion of edited rodents spreading involuntarily through their country without any kind of consultation or permission process. So my lab in parallel has been developing localized forms of gene drive that do not spread indefinitely because they run out of genetic fuel. And there are many other groups also working on this problem. These two concerns, reaching out to the Maori and ensuring that we develop the technology in ways consistent with their values insofar as possible and determine whether or not it was a good idea in Aotearoa, clashed with my concern over localization and safety. And that's because in calling for the exclusive development of local gene drive systems for conservation with a co-author who was from Aotearoa, we inadvertently sparked a bit of a political backlash in New Zealand over the suggestion that they might entertain doing something like a full power self-propagating gene drive that might spread beyond their borders. And we wrote this paper before I began engaging with our Maori partners. And I thoughtlessly just did not send it to them for feedback before we published it. And rightfully so, they called me out on it. As Melanie Mark Shadbolt said, although we did the right thing by engaging with them and insisting that we, could, we would only support it if it was developed and determined whether or not it would be used under a co-governance model with Maori, but my naivete of the political situation that they're in and the publication without talking to them may have political consequences for the Maori and their ability to ensure that their values are respected in Aotearoa that I wasn't aware of. In other words, we reached out to the Maori to gain to learn about their thoughts on the ecological consequences of potentially developing and using a technology in Aotearoa. But what I hadn't realized was that even publishing a paper has political consequences to the political ecosystem that can affect communities. And that's why it's so important that we do engage with local communities before we do anything that could have powerful repercussions on their way of life. And so whenever I gave a talk thereafter to any Maori audience or indeed any First Nations audience, I always tell this story because it underscores the importance of reaching out to communities and listening to them and taking their concerns seriously on all issues, not just the ones that we might think of, because we are all human and we all make mistakes. It is only together that we can potentially find shared wisdom. So I told this story at a subsequent meeting at a marae um, organized by Teharenga with a number of Maori conservation leaders. And there was very great interest in ensuring that the Mataranga and Maori values such as kaitiaki tenga, guardianship, and many others were respected during development. I cannot say that we have any agreement because we are still developing a relationship. And it's been my honor that they have been willing to continue working with us on this, even after my thoughtless mistake. And we have been continuing to build relationships. Here is Doug Jones of Rongo Fakaapa, Iwi, who actually came and visited us and talked with the citizens of Nantucket to learn about how we'd been engaging with the Mice Against Ticks project as a potential model for how the Iwis might work with us. And based on that feedback, we've determined that we will similarly in not develop any kind of localized gene drive system initially. Instead, we'll work with non-drive systems that do not increase in frequency once release. 
And we will develop it in a way that is more in accord with Maori values. That is the Maori see things in a much more holistic ecological manner. And they also have concerns about moving genes across species boundaries, but their view of species is defined ecologically by the relationship between organisms in the environment. And as they see it, the microbes in an organism's gut are a part of the organism because you never find the microbial consortia living on and around a mammal without the mammal. And you never find the mammal without the microbes. They help one another. It's a symbiotic mutualistic relationship. And so the notion that they're separate to many Maori simply does not make sense. And what that means is to respect the whukapapa, the lineage, the relationship, the ecosystem, we should use CRISPR systems that are derived from the native microbiota of the rodents that we intend to impact. So overall, I would just like to call for the United Nations to help us because the challenge with doing all of this, engaging communities early before the technology is developed is that we must be transparent with what we believe we can do. And that tips our hand to our scientific competitors who can then take the idea and throw more money in hands at the problem, publish it and get all of the credit first. Because I'm at MIT, I have a little bit more liberty to take chances on this, but it's unfair to ask the scientific community to do this without changing the incentives so that we're not punished for doing the right thing and inviting community guidance very early on, early enough to make a difference. So one way to do that would be for the United Nations to host a registry for all gene drive research and indeed all eco-technology research, gene editing to be applied to the environment with collective impacts. Because if we had a registry that required not just transparency, but active community sponsorship by a local community that is interested in the technology in order to register and proceed, then funders and academic journals and scientific societies could require registration for funding or recognition of the eventual work. And that would, in a single stroke, align our incentives with doing the right thing and inviting community guidance of these important technologies. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Kevin, for all this um, experience and all this uh, proposal. Uh, I think that uh, most likely we are going to get back on this idea of considering uh, eco-technology uh, as needed regulation, more or less the same way as health is uh, regulated. So now we are going to move to our third speaker, uh, Tessie Aken. Uh, Tessie is presently um, um, advisor to the uh, Swedish government considering health and social affairs. But we invited Tessie uh, because of her uh, functions uh, until a uh, recent time at the DHBO of U uh, Council of Europe and the wonderful work that uh, they published last year on uh, public engagement. So I think that uh, Sonia and uh, Kevin also already paved the way uh, to uh, help you, uh, Tessie, to, to go further how to promote, but also how to make the dialogue uh, real and effective. Tessie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. See if I can share my screen. So thank you, Heve, and uh, thank you to UNESCO for inviting me. Um, I want to first comment uh, that I thought that was very illustrative and thought provoking to hear the former pre pre presentations. Uh, and on a more practical level. And what I will present uh, um, is that I will uh, talk more about the policymaking aspect and principles of public debate. 
And uh, uh, today in this meeting, although I am representing the Swedish government by um, working as a health lawyer uh, for the National Board of Health and Welfare in Sweden, I also represent Sweden on the um, uh, Bioethics Committee uh, uh, at Con the Council of Europe. And uh, today I will be representing actually the com Bioethics Committee uh, and the work we are doing there and uh, especially uh, present the Oviedo Convention as the only international legally binding framework which uh, addresses both the question about public debate on biomedical issues uh, and also genome editing. So first, a little bit about the role of the Bioethics Committee. Uh, it was founded in 1997 and um, it's, uh, it was part of the Oviedo Convention that there should be a committee that supervises um, uh, and, and um, uh, reflects upon the questions in the Oviedo Convention and also does um, uh, reassessments if, if there's a need to include more or to uh, define the notions in the Oviedo Convention. Uh, the committee is an intergovernmental committee, meaning that uh, all the 47 member states of the Council of Europe are uh, represented on the committee. And it consists of experts that are not only there as experts of different professional backgrounds, it can be medical professionals, ethicists, lawyers, and so forth, uh, but they actually represent their member state and the government of their, their state. So um, the committee is specifically concerned with bioethics from a human rights perspective, uh, and uh, also with human rights challenges raised by new developments and emerging technologies in biomedicine. So of course, in recent years, the genome editing technologies have been a, a, a key question which we have been debating and discussing. Um, and the discussions and agreements uh, that we have in this committee lead member states and the governments in a common direction for whether and how we want the developments to be implemented in our legal systems, in our societies and our healthcare systems. So although we might choose different ways of implementing uh, the decisions and agreements we make uh, within the committee, uh, we, we try to, through these discussions and agreements, we keep aligned uh, and have um, in many cases uh, the same goal. Um, a little bit about the Oviedo Convention first, about the basics. It's uh, actually uh, named, has a lot, much longer name. It's called the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Dignity of the Human Being uh, with regard to the application of biology and medicine. And uh, as I mentioned, it's the only international legally binding framework on the protection of human rights in the field of biomedicine. Uh, which is uh, notable and which has also led to many observing states outside of these 47 member states following our work. Um, and the goal of the convention is protecting the dignity, integrity and identity of the human being and also protecting fundamental freedoms uh, by promoting ethically responsible research and ethically responsible introduction and use of treatments and technologies within medicine. And uh, uh, I was going to present to you what the committee is doing at the moment regarding the two articles that concern the, the topic of today, uh, today's uh, webinar. Um, so one of them being article 13 on genome editing and the other one article 28 on public debate. And I will start by uh, introducing you to article 28. Um, in Article 28, it is stated that uh, the parties to the Convention shall see to it that the fundamental questions raised by developments of biology and medicine are the subject of appropriate public discussion. And in the light in particular of relevant medical, social, economic, ethical, and legal implications. So there's many different aspects that need to come into play and many different voices need to be heard in the public di discussion and also that their possible application, and uh, I want to emphasize it's the possible application, is made the subject of appropriate consultation. 
And recently we have been discussing, uh, or we started this project many years ago actually, but um, uh, some five years ago, but uh, it, it uh, all came out in a guide to public debate, which our committee presented uh, uh, about uh, a year ago, uh, where we try to explain what this Article 28 really means when it comes to public debate and, uh, and the, the different aspects to be taken into consideration. So the Guide to Public Debate on Human Rights and Biomedicine, as it is called, um, was adopted a year ago in November 2019 and was launched last fall due to the pandemic. It took a little bit longer to get it um, to get the information out there, but we have already translated it into nine different languages and uh, uh, it, that work is continuing. Uh, and I wanted to show you just the first page of our guide. Uh, we made it into a digital guide, so it's easily accessible online, and we, we can click to read more under each heading. Uh, there's also a printed version, uh, which is um, about 80 pages long, so it's quite an uh, expensive, um, broad uh, guide, uh, which would be helpful for anyone organizing public debate, on bioethical issues especially. Uh, and uh, what the guide does, it, it, it elaborates Article 28 by describing the necessity to involve the public and how you can do that in a way to include as many different aspects as possible. Uh, and the guide is primarily addressed to decision makers and government officials and public authorities. And this is mainly due to the fact that the Oviedo Convention is also directed to, to the member states and puts an obligation on the member states to to make it possible or set the foundation for public debate in this area of biomedicine. Uh, but of course, if that um, responsibility has been delegated to national ethics committees, it can, the guide can be just as useful for them and any other organization who's organizing public debate within biomedicine. Um, so what does this guide do? It encourages policymakers and other relevant stakeholders to raise public awareness about biomedical developments, and especially to, have, to focus on the human rights implications that they may have. Uh, and it also promotes the exchange of information between, on one hand, the public, but also to involve the scientists and other experts as well, uh, and policymakers. Uh, and uh, the idea is that the policymakers can actually benefit from the public debate by feeding in the, the public's opinions and viewpoints and aspects into policymaking. Uh, it also identifies different approaches to public debate and uh, notably how to include vulnerable and overlooked groups. Um, and uh, that could be also, despite the, besides those who, who, who perhaps cannot access the digital platforms and how you should try to include uh, people that are older who might not have those means, um, but also groups that might be not directly affected, but are socially affected in some way by a certain development. And uh, it also encourages policymakers to anticipate and shape and develop sound law and policy in the biomedical field. Um, and I will come back to that when I go into article 13. Uh, and it also encourages to debate sensitive issues outside of the political arena and try to keep it uh, the, away from the vested interests so it becomes more a neutral platform. So what is the guide about? Uh, it's really about the need for public debate and how the, the, the public debate uh, part is really part of the democratic process um, uh, of um, considering how to make policies around a certain issue or a certain technology that might come into play. And it's also about how, what to consider when preparing for public debate and how to make it effective and meaningful. Um, it includes examples of public debate initiatives from different member states. And uh, there's some illustrations through these examples uh, of different considerations to take into account. Uh, and the one thing that I especially want to highlight is that it places particular emphasis on uh, how implications and consequences of biomedical develops, uh, developments uh, are not only a question for experts or authorities, but 
as much a concern for individuals and groups and society as a whole. And uh, that middle point is especially uh, applicable when it comes to genome editing technologies. At the moment, uh, part of our uh, action plan for the committee is translating the guide into as many non-official languages as possible and also disseminating it and presenting it in, in the Council of Europe member states. Um, but also we have set up on a journey to examine Article 13 of the Oviedo Convention uh, in the light of developments in gene editing technologies and examine, of course, the ethical challenges raised by these technologies. And that brings me into Article 13, uh, which reads, an intervention seeking to modify the human genome may only be undertaken for preventive, diagnostic, or therapeutic purposes, and only if its aim is not to introduce any modification in the genome of any descendant. Uh, and um, I want to enhance that this is, um, uh, or note that this is uh, an article which all the um, signatory parties are bound by in the Oviedo Convention. Uh, so it sets out a limitation to certain purposes. So somatic purposes are allowed uh, as long as it does not mean a, trans a transmissible uh, modification to descendants. Uh, and also uh, there has been some discussion about whether research is allowed or not. And it does not prohibit research as long as it does not uh, mean that, it, that the genome passes on to any de descendants. Uh, a little bit about the background to, to why this article came about is that uh, there was a discussion, of course, between the delegations around or the, the, uh, the drafting parties who made the Oviedo Convention that, uh, and they thought there was so many things that we did not know, so much uncertainty and unknown risk inherent to the introduction of modification in the genome, that there were fundamental reasons, and especially concerning the dignity and identity of the human being. Uh, so this would speak for not to modify human genome of the future generations, as long as there's many unknown risks. And this led to the prohibition. And the recent discussions among the delegations in the committee have shown also um, a united, or we have a, a common um, a feeling that, that the more uncertainty there is and the higher the stakes are in a certain uh, technology, the more urgent it is to promote public debate. In 2015, uh, the committee made a statement concerning uh, the genome editing technologies and said that we believe that we are convinced that the Oviedo Convention provides principles that could be used as reference for the debate called for at an international level on the fundamental questions faced by the developments. And we recalled Article 28. And in November 2018, again, we made a statement saying that ethics and human rights must guide any use of genome editing technologies in human beings, uh, and that the Oviedo Convention provides a unique reference framework to that end. Um, like I mentioned, we are the, uh, the committee is bound to re-examine regularly the convention, uh, especially um, with regard to scientific developments. And when it comes to genome editing technologies, uh, to this point, we have um, made a comparative inquiry between the member states to see how it's been regulated in the different countries, how Article 13 has been implemented. Uh, we'll, we've conducted an ethical study into the different aspects that come uh, that are interested, uh, interesting in this respect, mapping and analyzing the international debate also. Uh, and we've had a presentation amongst other presentations about the technical developments uh, by Professor Ian Tama from the University of, um, of uh, from George Washington University. Uh, and at the moment, there is an ongoing discussion between the member states, and we made an uh, intermediate conclusion in our last meeting in November, uh, not to change the provisions of Article 13. Um, all the member states agreed on this, but however, there are some aspects that could be clarified for example, when it comes to the question about research, whether it's 
ban uh, have prohibited or not. Uh, and um, and also the member states were invited to comment the need for cl further clarification of Article 13. So we're, it's still an ongoing discussion how it could be clarified. Uh, but what we could also conclude is that uh, there's um, a common, um, uh, a united uh, goal that regulation is needed to meet the rapid development in a responsible way. But there is a need for more research and there's a need for analysis of long term consequences before we can even consider to introduce this technology. And uh, the question, the really fundamental question is, should we at all and to what extent if we should. And uh, it, we are all in agreement that the human rights aspects must come first and to this end inclusive public debate is needed. And some of the fundamental questions that I wanted to raise that, uh, and for, more from a personal um, point of view, that, uh, that uh, also derives from the Oviedo Convention that we need to include in the debate is even if we uh, regard the technology as safe, we need to consider to what extent it is necessary and to what extent it is pr proportionate, or if it's proportionate at all, if there are alternatives. And a key question, a fundamental question is, can human dignity and identity be preserved if introducing this technology on humans? Um, to conclude, uh, some of the objectives of the, uh, of the um, uh, co committee is embedding human rights in the development of technologies uh, and fostering public dialogue to promote democratic governance and transparency in the field of biomedicine. And um, we, or I would like to, to uh, uh, draw the following conclusions. It's not too soon to initiate public debate on genome editing. Uh, and there are many calls, there have been many calls um, internationally for public debate, um, but it does not really, none of the articles really describe how it should be conduct conducted and what it should entail and which people it should include, which groups should be included. Uh, and, uh, and this has to be sorted out. And we saw uh, a very uh, good example presented by Sonia, but we, I think we also need to broaden the public debate uh, and have many different aspects considered before we uh, move on to the discussion about how. Uh, timing is really key. We need to have this public discourse and public debate before setting any criteria for how it should be done. Um, and it concerns all people, not only experts or directly affected patients that could, could have helped, be helped by this, but also others have to be involved. And uh, when doing a public debate, it's really also at the same time a competence building and information exercise where the participants uh, initially need a lot of information and different aspects to take into consideration before they can reach a conclusion about how, what they feel is the right pathway. Uh, and of course, the scientists have a really important role to play in conveying risks and possibilities. But at this point, we need to let others into the discussion, other experts of different professions and laymen also. Um, and uh, of course, governments and other actors must take steps towards a global dialogue because it's important that the governments take a, a step forward to, to promote public debate on this question and preferably on a global approach. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Tessie. And uh, thank you so much to uh, recall this uh, fundamental aspect of uh, the uh, Council of Europe uh, of Yedo Convention, uh, but uh, also what is uh, the a word, what are the words of uh, UNESCO? Because uh, if you consider at the same time or almost the same time the Universal Declaration on Human Genome and Human Rights, uh, Article 1, quote, uh, the human genome underlies the fundamental unity of all members of the human family, as well as the recognition of their inherent dignity and diversity. In a symbolic sense, it is the heritage of humanity. And obviously, when you have a heritage, you need to uh, not only share this heritage, but manage 
this heritage uh, all together. So uh, if I uh, may uh, pinpoint a few elements of uh, what the three of you have said, uh, we have heard uh, first that uh, a main question is uh, now with the development of emerging technology, uh, trust or distrust of the public. Um, how uh, can we uh, be sure that science uh, is uh, remaining a way to find some truth and uh, to be trusted? And uh, whereas some aspect of uh, technology uh, are uh, today highly distrusted when uh, they are not submitted to fake news. Uh, we have heard also that we absolutely need a responsible stewardship of science. And uh, we will discuss more, I think, the various aspects of this responsible stewardship of uh, science. We have heard that uh, uh, science should go now on uh, uh, two legs, uh, not only the scientific development, but also thinking before, anticipating, and uh, I think that ethics is uh, uh, perfectly uh, this aspect of anticipation, uh, anticipating uh, on the impact of the technology. So uh, we need uh, to be ethical by design, uh, to consider uh, the various aspects. Uh, uh, we need to hear uh, about the indigenous people and uh, particularly the Maoris, how they see life and how they consider a species uh, and the de their definition. And finally, we see that in, a democra in democratic societies, uh, the uh, public engagement is no more a matter of discussion. It needs to be a matter of uh, facts. So um, maybe we could uh, uh, start with a few uh, technical questions. Uh, maybe I will ask the first uh, technical question to Kevin. Um, you, you have these activities of public engagement that are in addition to your scientific work. Uh, obviously, it's your uh, responsibility to take the time, but for all these assemblies, for all these uh, discussions, and maybe some traveling uh, uh, to, to go from uh, uh, Boston to uh, New Zealand, uh, how did you get some support, uh, financial and also rising this community? Could you tell us a little bit more on your the way you you raised this incredible accomplishment. Well, thank you. That is a major barrier in the way of more laboratories similarly engaging with communities very early on. The primary barrier is the incentive to avoid disclosing what you're planning to work on lest someone else who is not engaging with a community jump on it and publish first. But still many of us are tightly funding constrained and don't necessarily have the funds to fly somewhere, especially, and engage with a local community over and over again. My laboratory is able to do it because of a number of generous philanthropic gifts, which we can use for any purpose. But most dedicated government grants do not include funds for community engagement. Even though the funders in this area have published papers recognizing the need for that, recognizing the problem and actually doing something about it is difficult because all of these funders are broad organizations and the actual program officers supporting research into gene drive and other eco-technologies need to justify their budgets to the higher ups. And it's not clear that there is a strong justification for doing that as yet. This is why the registry would help because it's a coordination problem. Insofar as it's the expectation that all scientists do this, then it will be easy to, for the funders to justify to their organizations that all research in the field needs to include some funding for community guidance of the research. Thank you, Kevin. Tessie, uh, within the guide that you published, did you uh, tackle this question of support and, and also recognition? Because uh, as uh, Kevin uh, rightly uh, 
mentioned, uh, scientists are generally recognized because of their uh, astonishing papers in nature science and, and so on and so far, and not that much for the time they are spending for uh, community engagement or public engagement. We didn't go into the details of who should fund uh, the initiatives, although uh, we did say that if there is a certain stakeholder who has also been funding the discussion, they should be, very, of course, very transparent about that fact uh, and transparent about what, the, what they were expecting to achieve through the public debate that they were organizing. Um, however, it, uh, the member states they have an obligation to see to it that there is, and that means that they need to promote public debate in the bioethical field, and that we enhanced. Um, and uh, how they decide to do it uh, is um, it varies a lot. And there are quite a few who have given a mandate to their national bioethics committees uh, to organize public debate on, on different topics. And we see that that is being conducted in many places. But in other countries, in many countries, there are, there's no specific organization who is supposed to do this. And, and then we also discussed a little bit about the scientists role and how, whether they do have a responsibility and we conclude that they do have a certain responsibility to communicate their findings and to the public also and, and carry a dialogue. But of course they need the support um, of the government to be able to do so. Thank you. And um, Sonia, you mentioned the three documentaries and uh, the way you are going to raise the initiative. Uh, I, I must mention that I'm one of the partner of this uh, among the 25 you mentioned. Uh, so uh, how are presently the situation uh, for the support of the, the various groups that are participating in this global initiative? Yeah. Um... There are two arms to the way we are running this. One arm is the film arm that I am responsible for and I raise my funding and I have my broadcasters all committed waiting uh, for it to begin. Uh, the first stage for us is we start filming in Australia uh, in April this year. Uh, the London team are beginning, the French team are beginning and the German and uh, Brazilian team have all begun as well. Um, and so each of the film components uh, I'm looking after the funding for those. And then the scientific research and the deliberative uh, democracy team who are running the actual event and designing the event, um, they have raised maybe half of their funding, I believe now, um, which is a substantial amount. Um, and we have full funding for the Australian event that will happen. What we're going to do is run a number of local, by local, I mean countrywide events, and they will lead to the global event. And we have seven of the uh, local countrywide national events funded um, and we're half funded for the global event. So we're still looking for partners to complete that funding. From my side, I have all of the broadcasters committed um, and we will trigger that funding once the date of the Global Citizens Assembly is confirmed. So we're in a very good position to see this happen. And one of the things I'm conscious of, Herve, is hearing the others speak, is you know how important it is that we don't try to do it perfectly, but we try to engage. You know, you can spend too long worrying about um, getting everything perfect. Let's get on with it and engage people. Um, I think this is really important. Thank you. So now we are going to let the floor to the public. We have more than 200 people that are uh, presently uh, online. Uh, so uh, I see uh, several uh, questions. Uh, if you want to, to raise a question, just raise your hand. Maybe we are going to start with Camille Duloir. Uh, if Camille Duloir can ask, uh, she has uh, two questions for Kevin Esfeld and Sonia Pemberton. Camille, are you uh, able to, to open your mic? Vous m'entendez bien? Oui, tout à fait. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you clearly. No, I can. No, no, please go ahead. We have the interpretation. 
Yes. <laughs> and now, uh, just thank you for your very much for this intervention. And um, you spoke a, you spoke a discussion with the population that you qualify as armed public. Where are they? And why you debate shape like uh, source uh, propose for the global citizens assembly present by Sonia Pontaton, uh, also uh, either and education, uh, a form of public engagement and an autonomization of the public process to a debate. So you are you are clearly raising the question of scientific literacy. Uh, Kevin and then Sonia. Kevin? Yes, that's a great question. So one of the reasons why we chose the Mice Against Ticks project is that Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard have very, very high levels of scientific literacy, as well as a tradition of community decision making. There are so many retired scientists and doctors on the <laughs> islands that virtually all residents know someone who can grasp and explain the technical details of our project. <laughs> and that's just not true elsewhere. The other benefit is that for a lot of the most urgent applications of these technologies, the moral, the moral ones where people and especially children will die every minute we don't do something, those ones typically involve populations that don't have high levels of scientific literacy. In fact, quite the opposite. And it's ethically awkward to propose interventions using novel technologies that haven't been tested elsewhere on impoverished communities, even though they're the ones who could most benefit. Whereas the notion that we could force the residents of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, which are some of the most powerful communities in the world, to do anything is just laughable. So it's very clear that the communities are in the driver's seat and they're highly educated, which means it's the, among the easiest populations to work with. To just to emphasize how unusual they are, most people are highly supportive of the idea because they really hate Lyme disease. And especially if we only use native mouse genes, they really like the idea. On Chapaquiddick, which is its own island on Martha's Vineyard, the local homeowners association voted more than 100 to zero to support the project and propose their island as an early field trial site. And one person on Nantucket, who is an unusual in not liking the idea, said, well, I can't say I'm fond of the idea myself, but I don't really know enough to decide. So I'll defer to the local PhD ecologist that she knows to weigh in on how you do this. And so I'll support whatever she thinks is best. That is, shall we say, extremely unusual for someone who does not like genetically modified organisms and avoids eating them herself. Thank you, Kevin, Sonia, and uh, Sonia, I, I will add to, to the question uh, another uh, raised by Farah Wichati, uh, who is raising the question, would you please explain how uh, is your relationship with public stakeholders, government and NGOs? Can we consider you as an influencer? <laughs> I've never aspired to being an influencer. Um, I guess the relationship, I, I, am, I run a small television production company, a very specialized production company, so I have no formal relationship with NGOs and so forth. But I'm partnered up with two universities um, to make this project, the University of Canberra and the University of Tasmania. And then through them, they have accessed funding through our government and various philanthropic groups. As far as I'm aware, there's no NGOs involved at this point. Obviously, on the consortium, the, the, the group that um, are collaborating with us, there are people from many different backgrounds. Um, so there's 25 odd people, uh, like including Hervé. Um, I don't see myself as an influencer, but I see myself as someone who um, 
I'm very interested in the subject and I, I, I was looking for how I could contribute and I became aware of all the other films that were being made two years ago, um, of which the ones Kevin is inv- has been involved with and the Nova specials. I mean, I've watched them and I thought for a while that I didn't need to contribute anything because there's enough films and television programs out there and some of them are very good. Um, But the point is, what I want to influence is this gap in public uh, consideration of the issue. Um, How can we help do something about it? So my motivation, my, my trying to be an influencer in a sense, is saying, please, let's think bigger about how we do public engagement. It's not enough. It's good that we have the smaller groups all over the world and we have these committees and other committees, but how can we generate big events where we get millions of people engaged with this issue? That's my focus. And not just one screening of one film, but this whole kind of interactive, um, multi-dimensional um, project where people are going through a process other people are watching the process you can engage with it online there's quite an elaborate strategy around this um so i'm just trying to shake it up a little bit and see if i can get something happening (laughs) i think there's been so much talk you know and what kevin's doing is real i mean he's one of the few people i think who's actually taken this stuff out into the field at this level and it's amazing but it's got to be more of it. We've got to find different and different ways of doing it, you know, lots of different ways of doing it at the biggest scale and the most diverse scale we can get. Thank you. Uh, we are going to, to continue on this line uh, with, uh, uh, avec une question de Joël Moquet. We have a question from Joël Moquet, Mobika Ekabela from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Joël, are you connected? Can you hear us? Otherwise, I will read out your question, Joël. It's a question regarding the our understanding of scientific data and also our genuine capacity for debate. And this is the issue of providing uh, data in the language in which uh, which people use their own language for example um, and I'm speaking French but of course many communities speak in their they voice their linguistic diversity and they think in their own uh, language their, their mother tongue so um, how? Can we mobilize, harness resources in order to ensure that there is a dialogue in the different uh, native languages? Uh, we need uh, multiple, uh, multiple languages, multiple translation, uh, and, and especially when the 100 will gather all together you will be a kind of Babel situation. So, uh, Sonia, or I don't know, Kevin, how how are you discussing with the Maori people? (laughs) Sonia, Sonia, go Uh, first. uh, Okay, Um, we are planning to do uh, the Global Citizens Assembly in multiple languages. I believe we have budgeted for 14 or 15. I cannot remember exactly how many. Uh, It's complicated, uh, but we are planning to have the materials um, produced in the relevant languages, the facilitators speaking in the relevant languages. Makes it a nightmare for me as a filmmaker to make the film about this, I have to say. But the actual process is more important than the film. So, um, and then of course my film can be translated. That's easy enough. Um, so that's how we're approaching it. We have we've been advised, and we can see very clearly that this is a very important point. That the way you think about some of the concepts is different across different languages. And I have found that already in starting to discuss with, say, the Chinese, some of the Chinese counterparts about how we might do some of this. Um, some of the people in um, Indonesia.
Asia have a different way of thinking. Our indigenous people here have different ways of thinking about these issues. So we are aware of how complicated it is. We can't do it in every language. Uh, we will choose, I think it is 14 or 15, and, and that will have to do for the first citizens assembly. This is a beginning, not the end. <laughs> um, Kevin, speaking with the Maoris. So, the obvious advantage of working with the Maori is that virtually all of them speak excellent English. So there simply are not the same translation <laughs> barriers that are in place. Um, that said, we do encourage them to deliberate in Maori. And that does shape one's worldview as best I, a non-speaker, can understand it. Um, it. I will say that engaging with the Maori is definitely more challenging due to that, due to the worldview difference. But I would also submit that it is more valuable precisely because of that degree of intellectual diversity and emphasis on holistic approaches to evaluation. That is, it is much easier for me to anticipate what the typical resident of Nantucket or Martha's Vineyard is going to believe because culturally I am much more similar to them. Whereas the Maori cultural tradition is quite different and has forms of wisdom that we have lost or never developed. And that's one reason why I absolutely support engaging with as many relevant moral worldviews, cultural worldviews as possible on these questions, because people really do have insights that could not occur to another culture. And this concept of an ecosystemic is one that would never have originated, I don't think, from a Western population, this notion that we could use the CRISPR system from the microbes of the mammal that we intend to edit. And that that is holistically more similar than using a CRISPR system that does not exist simply because you think of the organism as a whole rather than being these are microbes and these are mammals and that is very different. That I think required something more like the Maori worldview. But when we explain it to folks on, in Massachusetts, they immediately grasp the concept. So this is an example of, of a cultural worldview that can actually be translated across cultures and that people from different backgrounds find very compelling. So it's that kind of wisdom that we're seeking. And I can only imagine how much more we're still missing. Yes, and, and I think that you are perfectly right that um, it's, uh, it's an important dialogue for science and uh, you can have a more or less the same uh, question of symbiosis uh, when you think of uh, fighting uh, malaria uh, by uh, infecting the mosquitoes with Volvachia and, and you can decrease the, the transmission of uh, malaria by infecting uh, with this uh, uh, with Volvachia which is uh, a microbe uh, that infect mosquitoes. So it's, uh, it's clear that we have uh, many ways and uh, it's very interesting, this idea that uh, the discussion with the public is not only uh, on the use of the, the technology, but could raise new scientific questions and new ways of trying to set our experimental uh, design. Uh, I have a question of uh, Oliver Finney, uh, which is uh, uh, maybe of, uh, of importance. Uh, what are the, the panel view on the influence of IP patents. Uh, obviously, uh, this question is rising, ticking, uh, uh, ringing a bell for me because of the uh, statement we have made on COVID vaccine and the importance of leverage, leveraging any uh, hurdle uh, to produce the vaccine. So is there any, any question about the intellectual property uh, and the uh, patenting control in the field of genome editing technology. Uh, Tessie, is, is it something that you, you have thought about? Uh, Kevin, is, is it something uh, you are concerned uh, working from Harvard and with all the, the battle between uh, Harvard and Berkeley on these uh, patenting problems? Um, Tessie? Thank you. Uh, yeah, it, the, the question about patents is a really complicated, legally complicated question. And um, 
it's actually one that uh, in a way we will be addressing when we talk about equity to healthcare as one of the pillars that is in our strategic action plan for the committee, because uh, the more expensive a treatment or a drug becomes, of course, the fewer people get access uh, to a treatment. Uh, so, so it is something that we need to consider also from a human rights perspective, uh, and then work our way back to, to look at when, uh, when patents can be uh, sh should perhaps not be motivated. Um, and, and it's a very complicated question when it comes to genome editing uh, technologies, of course, obviously. And uh, there is a regulation within the EU that, uh, that um, uh, would be applicable, but that is now under revision. Uh, so so it, it will be one of the hot discussions, I think, within the EU also. Um, may I just comment on uh, one, one thing that you brought up earlier about the cultural differences and the la linguistic issue, I wanted to point out just that in the guide to public debate, we've given some examples of how one can do um, a co-design with the participants of the public debate. Uh, and I think it's worthwhile to take a look there at um, uh, how that can build more trust into the process of building the questions for the, the to be discussed in the debate. Uh, and how that can be done through already existing, uh, like there's one example from France of a very large public debate that took place that, that uh, used the existing structure of the uh, regional ethics committees. Uh, so I just wanted to come back with that little note to, to inform you about that. Thank you, thank you. Uh, it, it, it's uh, one, one of the things we have also in our bioethics laws is that it's within the law that before the revision of the law, which is uh, uh, an obligation every seven years, uh, there, need, there is uh, the, the obligation for the government and for the National Bioethics Committee to organize a national scale uh, discussion. Uh, the last time, which was a couple of years ago, uh, it was more than 250. 50,000 people that participate in this national debate. So most likely we need instruments to um, put the debate as a, a matter of uh, obligation, more or less to try to, to continue on what Kevin uh, said on uh, ethical by design or, or at the very beginning of the process, you need uh, a public discussion to, to go further. Um, Sorry, Lee, uh, it, uh, it becomes late. Uh, so uh, the three of you, if you have one more word, one sentence, Sonia to say. Sonia, one more uh, word. Yeah. Um, one thing that comes up for me is the idea of the debate. Uh, deliberation is not a debate. Deliberation is consideration and conversation. So I would like to open it, not to a debate, but to deliberate. And I think that is my, my point of difference in there. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Senya. Tessi? Thank you. Uh, your, last, uh, your last sentence. Thank you. Uh, I would like to continue from the previous speaker saying that that is uh, the key is really to start the discussion, the deliberation between people, and uh, to start uh, now and not later, because we need to also build capacity in order to be able to even debate the questions. And, uh, mm -hmm. and by saying public debate, I, uh, we, we have not um, been talking, or from the Council of Europe, we're not talking only about the debate in, a, in the sense of having different opinions. Uh, but it's also uh, about um, just infor informing and uh, and discussing and learning about the issue. Uh, so I, well, my message would be: do not wait and use any different um, media or uh, fora that is possible. It, it doesn't need to be an organized event. It might just as well be uh, discussions in schools and educational. Um, information to, to provide for teachers so that they can take the discussion with the young people and, and so forth. Different arenas are important. Thank you. Kevin, uh, the last word before we close the debate, the, the panel, the panel, sorry. If we really truly seek local community guidance in designing the technologies 
that will help define our future, then we need to change the incentives to encourage everyone involved, but especially the scientists developing those technologies to actually engage with communities and be transparent from the get-go. And right now those incentives are misaligned and it's a coordination problem. Everyone would love to change it, but they can't all agree on when and exactly how. So that's why I, my hope is that a single UN registry for gene drive and other eco technologies could be a focal point that everyone could agree on because it's something that we all want. It's just, how can we make it happen? Thank you. Um, we will take your words, Kevin, and we will help you to make it happen because uh, we have most likely instruments, uh, especially at UNESCO uh, in combination with WHO. Uh, Daphna, uh, we need to come to an end with this wonderful uh, meeting, wonderful round table, uh, thanking once again all the organizer and the panelists and the audience. Sorry, uh, we had so many questions, it could last for days. Daphna, uh, the floor is yours for a short conclusion. Thank you very much, Hervé. I just really, really want to start by thanking you as uh, also as a moderator and with your very insightful words and uh, and uh, wrapping up of the messages of each of the of the fantastic speakers that uh, that have made this uh, an extremely engaging and rich that, uh, round table. Uh, public awareness and public engagement has always been at the, at the core of UNESCO's activities in bioethics and ethics of science and technology. And I think this round table is just a living testimony of how important it is for us. Uh, we, we serve always as a platform to bring together actors to share their experiences to achieve, uh, to, achieve, to achieve this kind of goal. And UNESCO has been engaging with the public at the international level in different ways. Uh, for more than 25 years, including the process of elaborating normative instruments, such as the declarations of the human genome, human rights, but also the one on bioethics and human rights, including also the Global South, because I saw there was also a question about it in the questions and answers. What about the people with, on, with less uh, resources? And we have also developed and published guidelines specifically for national bioethics committees, because as Tessie said, uh, in, in many countries, this has been uh, <clears throat> decided that it could be uh, uh, conducted by the existing structures. And in fact, it has been a very nice work uh, and, and communication between the Council of Europe and UNESCO while we, both of us were developing the guidelines. And I apologize for my voice. Uh, and then I think you can see them in the chat, the reference to our guidelines. And, uh, and as, as you said, also at the beginning, Hervé, is very important to go from information to engagement and to empowerment. And I think that uh, uh, one of the things that we wanted to really encourage through this round table is uh, giving these particular examples, but also to convince the people and all the uh, all of us, all of the ones who are following uh, the, the round table that each of us are part of civil society and each of us have something to say and all of us know what we want and all of us, regardless of uh, of where we come from, we know what what are um, what are our fears and our, our ambitions, and uh, we all have values that we want to express. I think Sonia is an example of I I don't know if to call her layperson because she herself said I'm not a a, um, a scientist whatever, but she is really pushing now from. To going from not not looking from uh, from the local existing assemblies, but making uh, this fantastic experiment of going global. All of us have a role to play. We all have we are we all know what we are afraid of, and uh, and what we want to. And it's the same as we say in the in the bioethics in the, when we speak about informed consent in in the in the clinical setting, for example. And I really like. Uh, her pointing that uh, it's, we need to stop saying about us and them when, when we speak about experts and people. Uh, and it's also fantastic to have her because uh, using videos is uh, also very much in line with UNESCO's mission, which is promoting art and making art also uh, working for uh, 
communication and international co cooperation with, between uh, between countries. Uh, I think Kevin is in, it's the perfect perfect uh, example of how important is engaging communities at the very beginning of design, as, as you said, uh, and not so, not only having and and I also think it is very important what he said that not necessarily the people who are participating are all the time considered as representatives. Uh, but uh, but they're still uh, part of the communities. And I think it was already said also by you that it's not only about listening of the wishes and expectations of people, but how they can also uh, teach science uh, how to how to better do the, and scientists how to better do their job. I think uh, uh, the honesty and the courage of Kevin is also uh, particularly to be on their line because ethicists, uh, we have been claiming all the time that researchers have to inv to get involved with the, the communities, but it's not so clearly, it, it hasn't come, ac come across so clear uh, by a scientist in, in the way Kevin does it. And I think honesty pays because uh, the community wanted to continue to work with him regardless of uh, of what they feared was a political impact on their on on one public publication of the results, and I think it's also what from the ethicists uh, we are always always time saying when you when you engage with communities it's not only about their knowledge but what will happen afterwards when when you use their knowledge how are you you're going to use it it's part of the ethical uh, considerations that you have to take in mind so and um, and clear. Clearly, the the honesty and uh, and the seriousness uh, that in engagement with people shows that it's it's helping, and I think it was very helpful also to have the Tessie's points of view from the policy making and reminding us not, uh, as you also said, that public uh, debate and engagement is not only important in non-binding instruments and as all the declarations of UNESCO, but also in the binding ones as of the convention. And we have heard the call to join forces with researchers, with artists in the effort to engage communities and with some concrete examples. And here we are for, as you said, um, we also heard about the remaining challenges to be addressed, to get a real full international public engagement, to move to empowerment, to ensure that language is taken into account, which is more more than words, but views, world views. Uh, so if I think, uh, if we can also move to, uh, and clarified that it's not the same to debate, but to deliberate and to come with some constructive and, and effective participation of communities. And we, if we have reached our goal to convince everybody that uh, all of us have something to say, regardless of the field of work that we come from or the expertise that we that we come from, that to be to participate either in one of the projects that we've heard or any other local um, uh, endeavor that you are aware of, uh, then we are we have been accomplished our goal of this uh, of this roundtable. So thank you very much to the fantastic panelists and you are there as moderator. Thank you very much for the audience and the very good questions. We hope that you enjoyed the roundtable and we are going to uh, we are going to send you um, an automatic link. You are going to receive an automatic link to a survey. Uh, that it will be very useful for us to have your feedback uh, if about about the roundtable. And finally, uh, we are going just for information. We are going to have another one, a roundtable on ethics of artificial intelligence on the twenty sixth of March, uh, from one to three, and we will send you information shortly uh, about this. So with this, I really want to thank again and. Uh, to, to everybody and the public and thank you very much. Have a nice uh, afternoon, good day, evening for each of you. <laughs>